Hello and welcome to another edition of Cardiac Imaging Agora. This afternoon, we have a special guest, uh, Dr. Tom Wang. He's one of our advanced uh, imaging fellows at the Cleveland Clinic. Again, in the tradition of the Cleveland Clinic, he's uh, doing a multimodality imaging, so he would be uh, uh, doing uh, echocardiography, advanced echocardiography, CT, MRI, and uh, some nuclear on the side. Uh, Tom comes to us from uh, New Zealand. Uh, congratulations on uh, going down to zero numbers for cases. A fantastic uh, achievement. Uh, Tom has uh, recently published a very nice paper on multimodality imaging for cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, an update on that, and uh, this is an opportunity for us to learn from him. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, uh, Dr. Jaber, and it's a great privilege to be able to present on this uh, exciting new forum for um, Cardiac Imaging Agora. So today I'm going to uh, talk about multimodality imaging for cardiac amyloidosis, a contemporary update, uh, and this is based on a uh, recent uh, publication in the World Journal of Radiology, which I worked with um, under the guidance of Dr. Jaber and Dr. Zhu, another staff at um, Cleveland Clinic, as well as Osama Abel Hassan, another imaging fellow. So we won't talk too much about the clinical features of cardiac amyloidosis, but here's a summary slide. So we know that cardiac amyloidosis is an abnormal extracellular deposition of pathological misfolded amyloid proteins that causes toxicity to the myocardium leading to heart failure and death. There's two main subtypes of cardiac amyloidosis, the AL subtype um, as well as the ATTR subtypes. And um, ATTR is usually occurs with increasing age. Um, it's it's a, um, caused by misfolded liver-made proteins or pre-albumin, whereas AL amyloidosis is associated with uh, diseases of affecting uh, hematological malignancies from free light chain uh, cancers. And therefore, AL can occur in younger patients as well as in older patients. A cardiac amyloidosis is increasingly being detected as part of um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. In one study, about 13% of patients, as well as in aortic stenosis patients going for TAVR in 12% of those patients. The main clinical presentation of cardiac amyloidosis includes diastolic heart failure, arrhythmias, particularly heart block, atrial fibrillation, and low cardiac output state. And of course, it's associated with a range of extra cardiac manifestations listed on the screen there, some of which are more common in AL amyloidosis and others more common in ATTI amyloidosis. When patients present to us in the cardiac imaging for echocardiography, the main differentials to consider are those with also having left ventricular hypertrophy or increased wall thickness, such as hypertensive cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, aortic stenosis, and other infiltrative diseases such as sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis, and Fabry's disease. The main investigations first line include ECG, showing, for example, low voltages and pseudo-infarct patterns. Blood tests such as cardiac uh, biomarkers are often elevated, such as the NT-ProPMP and troponins and of course, hematological blood tests such as free light chains and protein and urine uh, electrophoresis. Endomyocardial biopsy is often required uh, as the gold standard tests, and it can also be performed in other organs with, for which amyloid is affecting. So the first imaging modality usually used to assess for uh, cardiac amyloidosis is echocardiography. And this table presents the main things we should be looking for in patients with suspected cardiac amyloidosis. So we assess their chamber size, left ventricular size and uh, ejection fraction. We look at the wall thickness. We look at um, whether there's increased echogenicity in the echocardiography. Although this is less uh, apparent in modern day scanners with harmonic imaging, where most of the images uh, appear bright. Diastolic functions are important to assess because cardio cardiac amyloidosis causes a restrictive type of cardiomyopathy. Um, we look at strain and we'll go through why this is important, but we assess global longitudinal strain, which is often reduced, as well as looking at regional strain with the apical spearing pattern, which we'll show you in the next few slides. We can also assess atrial size and function with the atrium often being dilated because of diastolic dysfunction. Um, we look at the interatrial septum, which is often thickened, and also amyloid can affect the right ventricle as well. We assess right atrial pressures and right sided pressures, look for valve thickness, which can often increase in amyloid 
and so as uh, signs of pericardial fusion. So here are some figures uh, demonstrating examples of what we can expect to see in a patient with cardiac amyloidosis. On the top left, we can see signs of increased left ventricular thickness. And we call that increased thickness rather than hypertrophy because amyloidosis is an extracellular deposition of these abnormal proteins. And in this patient, we can also see a small pericardial fusion posteriorly. In the second panel on B, we can see assessment of diastology, where we do pulse wave Doppler of the mitral inflow and we can see that this patient has a very high E to A ratio of 2.9, which would be consistent with a restricted cardiomyopathy or severe diastolic dysfunction. And this is supplemented by the bottom left where we can see tissue Doppler of the septal and lateral mitral annulus showing very low E prime, weight, um, e -prime velocities of only four centimeters per second. And combining the panel B and C, we can see that there's a very high E to E prime ratio both with the septum and lateral wall of about 40 which is very elevated. The bottom, left, uh, bottom right presents their uh, strain plot of the left ventricle on speckle tracking echocardiography, which is pretty much routine practice in our laboratories. And we can see that there is an apical sparing pattern. And what we mean by that is the apical walls have preserved strain um, in the sort of negative uh, 17, negative 20 or higher, whereas the basal and mid walls have impaired strain. So we get the cherry on top uh, um, and here we can see that the global longitudinal strain was negative 9.8%, which is also significantly impaired. And this really um, came from a paper that was also published by um, previous staff and other colleagues here at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, this paper was published in Hart in 2012, showing the importance of uh, plotting these strains um, to look for regional differences. And you can see that in this study, they compared cardiac amyloidosis with other forms of uh, cardiomyopathies that have increased wall thickness, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and aortic stenosis. And what they took was the average of the apical walls, the strains in the apical walls, compared to the average of strains in the basal and the mid portions. And they find that if this ratio was greater than one, then it's uh, quite uh, consistent with cardiac amyloidosis with high sensitivity and specificity. So we can see in this uh, figure that the top panels all demonstrate uh, cardiac amyloidosis where we have the apical uh, sparing pattern and clearly the ratios greater than one where the average of the apical strains are higher than the average of the basal and midwall strains. In the bottom left, we see examples of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with thick, uh, where the septum is thick. And here the regional strain is impaired where the septum is thick in the basal uh, septum, inf uh, intro and septum and infraseptum compared to the remaining heart which has, which has preserved strain. And in the bottom right are examples of aortic stenosis where there is global impairment of strain from uh, global uh, concentric hypertrophy. And this will be a similar pattern in those with significant hypertensive cardiomyopathy as well. Next, we move on to cardiac uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, which has now become a very essential tool in the assessment for cardiac amyloidosis. The four main protocols, we, or actually the three main protocols we use are the top three, which is a steady state free precision semi-imaging. And this allows us to provide real-time information to assess the cardiac size and function, as well as wall thickness and mass. And it also allows us to see whether there's any pericardial fusion and assess the size of the atrium. Next, we have the um, gadolinium imaging, so delayed enhancement imaging, which we can see characteristically in amyloid there is um, abnormal gadolinium kinetics with uh, either difficulty to null or there is diffuse um, late, late gadolinium enhancement on these images, which we'll show you some examples as well. And uh, more recently, a commonly used technique is uh, T1 mapping, which assesses the longitudinal relaxation of uh, protons in the heart, in the myocardium. And the characteristic sign in amyloid is that there's a markedly elevated uh, native T1 mapping pre-contrast and an increase in the extracellular volume uh, in the post-contrast study. So compared to a normal myocardium, both these values are very high and it's also higher than other forms of cardiomyopathy such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or related to aortic stenosis. The extracellular volume does require contrast administration to compare the pre and post uh, T1 values as well as a measurement of the hematocrit. Uh, whereas the native T1 can actually be performed even without gadolinium and contrast. And some centers also use uh, T2 mapping uh, to assess this, 
And there's been a few studies that show that this may also be elevated in amyloid patients. So here's some examples of what we just discussed. So the top left panel comes from this uh, SSFP images, which uh, is usually a real-time cine image. And you can see in this setting that again, they have globally increased uh, left ventricular wall thickness, uh, different to, for example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where um, the most common pattern is just in the septum and sometimes just in the apex or also globally. And this patient um, also has a small uh, pericardial fusion. On the top right, we can see example of the delayed gadolinium enhancement imaging. And normally the, uh, the myocardium nulls and therefore is black in uh, delayed gadolinium enhancement imaging, but you can see that in this patient that it's globally of, uh, of higher signal intensity in the myocardium. So a diffuse process affecting the myocardium, which is often seen in patients with cardiac amyloidosis. Notably, um, in some other patients, the myocardium may be black with just patchy areas of um, gadolinium enhancement that do not follow a vascular distribution like ischemic cardiomyopathy um, or just affecting localized in one part of the heart like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's a much more diffuse process. The bottom images are what we um, do for T1 mapping. So these are MOLLE images in the bottom right, which is a T1 map that um, looks at how high the T1 values are. And this is again traced on these images so what we can see here is that this person we've uh, traced on the, um, on the scanner and uh, it provides a T1 value of 1,427 with a standard deviation in R squared. R squared showing that it's a very um, accurate measurement, the higher it is to one. Uh, and you can see that the T1 value is very elevated in this patient. So for a usual 1.5 Tesla scanner, the upper limit of normal is about 1,000 or close to 1,000. And for a three Tesla scanner, it's around 1,000. 200 or 1,300, but this person was uh, well above that. And you can see on the T1 color map that it's uh, in the high range uh, around with the uh, with pink color. And this again is consistent with uh, the cardiac amyloidosis process. And the use of these uh, more novel techniques, including native T1 and ECV, as well as uh, late gallium enhancement, was uh, actually recently published in a meta analysis from uh, earlier this month in Jack Imaging. And in pulling 18 diagnostic studies and 13 prognostic studies of uh, over 2,000 patients, um, we can see that the, all three techniques are very good at diagnosing cardiac amyloidosis as standalone tests, probably better for the best for ECV with 89% sensitivity and specificity, followed by native T1, and LG being um, slightly less than that. And in addition, all three of these measurements, uh, if you take the median uh, in these studies, were also highly prognostic and predictive, independently predictive of all-cause mortality during follow-up, particularly so for ECV. And therefore, these uh, MRI parameters not only provide diagnostic information, but also prognostic information. And the pool uh, odds ratios and hazard ratios, odds ratios for diagnosis and hazard ratios for survival are shown in the bottom. Next, we talk about nuclear imaging. Um, and there's main, two main um, forms of nuclear imaging that are currently used in the assessment of cardiac amyloidosis, which is SPECT and PET. Um, and for the SPECT, we uh, use the phosphate technetium phosphate derivatives. And this is uniquely useful because it allows us to distinguish between T ATTR amyloid uh, because it binds calcium-rich TTR proteins compared to AL amyloidosis. Um, and this uh, information is usually gathered on uh, assessing the myocardial radio tracer uptake and grading the myocardial uptake compared to the rib uptake and also comparing um, between the heart and the contralateral lung with a ratio of more than 1.5 as being uh, suggestive and also correlates with mortality. And PET in the field of cardiac amyloidosis is more novel and um, uses these fluorine, mainly these fluorine um, derivatives for radioactive tracers and again, assessing the standard uptake value and then the target to background ratios and myocardial retention index and help um, support a diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. It's been shown also to be of some prognostic value as well, including when fused uh, with CT or MRI. So here are some uh, examples of uh, nuclear imaging. This is a SPEC patient, and you can see in uh, the left panel A, you see that there's diffuse increase in uptake on nuclear imaging uh, with cardiac amyloidosis. In the middle, you can see that the heart to the contralateral lung ratio is 1.63, which is elevated, uh, also suggestive of amyloidosis. In the far right, we have a fusion image with CT 
which again shows areas of the myocardium, including the septum and the uh, diffuse process around that suggests that there is uh, infiltration with cardiac amyloidosis. So the current, um, most current uh, diagnostic criteria for cardiac amyloidosis was reported by a joint uh, society. Uh, there was the Nuclear Society, Echocardiography Society, AHA, uh, and they came up with this uh, diagnostic criteria in 2019. So if we have an endomyocardial biopsy which supports cardiac amyloidosis, then that is standalone enough uh, for diagnosis. So we get the typical um, Congo red staining with polarized light and it shows apple green biorefringence, or you can use immunohistochemistry or mass spectrometry. If you have an extra cardiac source of biopsy, um, then you need supplementary information, preferably from cardiac imaging, uh, whether it's, uh, and sometimes biomarkers as well, will be supportive if it is AL amyloidosis. And if there's no uh, biopsy information available, then you can still consider the diagnosis uh, if you have a combination of um, uptake on uh, nuclear imaging, if there's free light chains um, to support AL amyloidosis and typical imaging findings. And the Im typical imaging findings we've talked about already, but to summarize it here, for echocardiography, it's increased wall thickness, more than 12 millimeters, the relative apical spearing on the strain map um, with the apical average um, being higher than the basal to mid average for uh, left ventricular strain, higher as in more negative, and also uh, significant diastolic dysfunction of at least moderate or severe. For MRI, again, there's the up uh, increase in left ventricular wall thickness, also the extracellular volume ECV we talked about of being more than 0.4, which is significantly abnormal. Normal is usually being about 0.2 to 0.3. The abnormal gadolinium kinetics we've talked about, including the difficulty to null the myocardium compared to the bulk pull or diffuse uh, gadolinium enhancement as an infiltrator process. Um, and also for um, imaging findings, which they've advocated using PET, um, the myocardium to blood pool ratio more than 1.5, and retention index of more than 0.03 per minute. There are some strengths and limitations to each of these uh, modalities. ECHO, of course, is the um, free, uh, most accessible, low cost and portable without radiation or contrast. It uniquely allows us to assess for diastolic dysfunction and also assess strain, um, but it does have some more low specificity um, in terms of trying to distinguish between the different cardiomyopathies, per, except for maybe strain. Um, and of course has variable spatial resolution that's operated and patient dependent. In terms of MRI, um, this has very high spatial resolution. It's the gold standard for chamber quantification, also the preferred option for tissue characterization, including with uh, LGE, T1 mapping, and ECV assessment, but it is associated with um, uh, higher cost um, and some issues with patients who may be either claustrophobic or have um, MRI non-compatible metallic devices. And, uh, both this and ECHO cannot distinguish AL versus ATTR, as opposed to nuclear imaging, which is able to distinguish between AL and ATTR uh, amyloidosis and help supplement the assessment for cardiac amyloidosis with its own limitations. So therefore, in summary, um, the recent advances in multimodality imaging has really helped with the diagnosis and also prognostic risk stratification assessment for cardiac amyloidosis. And this is very important in the era of improving treatments to try and be able to identify these um, cardiac amyloidosis early on to start treatment early. Echocardiography is important. It's the first line uh, assessment and chamber quantification, diastolic assessment, as well as uh, strain assessment. MRI is very useful for chamber quantification, tissue characterization, and quantifying the degree of infiltration with T1 mapping and ECV. And nuclear imaging is helpful for particularly spec for distinguish between AL and ATTI amyloidosis and assess um, and help firm up the diagnosis for cardiac amyloidosis. And with this, this will be um, very helpful for to try and improve clinical outcomes in this, what was traditionally a very hard diagnosis to make with poor outcomes and with imaging and treatments, um, outcomes have seemed to be improved with these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions. This is a fantastic overview. And uh, again, it walks us through the uh, least uh, invasive, least uh, cost intense uh, modality to probably the most cost intense, which is MRI and nuclear. Um, the, the, the important points uh, you made, most of them is uh, this was a 
diagnostic curiosity when I started doing medicine. And because we didn't have anything except telling the patient, you know, if we missed it, the tragedy was we missed the prognosis. But now if we miss it, uh, there is a, a two sides of, uh, of, uh, of it. One, if we don't make the right diagnosis, the patient is being denied uh, treatment that's uh, been shown beautifully to reduce uh, uh, mortality and morbidity uh, by anywhere between 30 and 40% uh, in the TTR side. And that's the AL side is the issue of this is an emergency almost to diagnose these patients early because the prognosis is extremely uh, poor if they're not treated uh, immediately. Now, on the, on, the, uh, on the flip side is now because it's, there's so much awareness in this uh, disease, we're starting to identify patients based not only on uh, family history and uh, uh, referral from families and, uh, and uh, uh, other subspecialties, but also uh, from genetics uh, and genetic det detection of the disease. And the challenge we're gonna face going forward is how specific is our technology for picking up this mm -hmm. in, let's say, in ECHO, uh, where we're starting to see some other disease entities in ECHO that have this apical sparing pattern, which we thought was pathognomonic for um, uh, amyloid. And the, on the nuclear side and the MRI side is how sensitive these things are. So when we're imaging people who have familial, let's say, amyloidosis without any clinical manifestation, except, let's say, carpal tunnel or even none of these things, how sensitive these things are. We know the sensitivity in patients who present with heart failure. Most of the reports and series you showed and we published and many other centers are patients with class three or two heart failure, even further class four heart failure. So we know these things are very sensitive. Yes. Only very specific when you present with that advanced disease, but we don't know how good they are in asymptomatic patients. That's so right. yesterday, actually, it's a funny story. Yesterday, it was probably our 1600s technetium pyrophosphate scan done at the Cleveland Clinic in the past nine years. It's number 1600, so I happen to be the person reading it. <laughs> yes. And that's a, f a fascinating case, a person who's never uh, had any issues with heart failure, a solid, completely normal uh, EKG, completely normal echocardiogram, including, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, uh, tissue Doppler, including uh, uh, global strain, completely normal. MRI, completely normal bilateral carpal tunnel, a, uh, a rare genetic uh, variant, I don't, can't recall it right now, of uh, familial amyloidosis. Yes. They did a nuclear uh, scan on the patient technetium pyrophosphate and it was strongly positive. So that makes me think about uh, the sensitivity of anything we do right now when we identify these patients uh, early. Uh, how many MRIs, since you're, you're today out fresh out of MRI, uh, how many uh, you're doing almost per week or per day for at the Cleveland Clinic? Yeah, so at the Cleveland Clinic, we usually do between 14 to 20 cardiac MRIs a day, uh, which is a very high volume compared to other centers. And we have uh, two fellows reading with one staff. Um, and I would say probably about half of the studies would be on one form of cardiomyopathy or another. And we would encounter um, MRIs for amyloidosis probably on a once a day basis or more, once or twice a day. So it's definitely quite often uh, quite often used in, in the setting. Um, and I guess coming back to your point about the screening process, I think the important thing is to try and, because it's important that the first line screening test is very sensitive. It doesn't have to be specific, but at least we start them, you know, thinking whether we need further tests. So that's why I think for echocardiography, sensitivity is very important. Um, but also about sort of the prognostic value of these markers. So if these, for example, you know, T1 mapping, ECB, and even the ratio of the strain pattern, um, that if it is abnormal, um, then it has prognostic implications that if even if we miss a few patients, if we know that those markers are strongly prognostic, then the ones we miss are those probably early in the disease process that have, um, that probably uh, can afford to have a bit of time before we diagnose them as opposed to the late end-stage ones, which we don't want to miss. So I think that's where um, echocardiography is important because that serves as the gatekeeper to whether we request other tests um, as well, on top of, of course, the clinical history. So the patient you mentioned about, um, obviously with the family history and the carpal tunnel syndrome, there has to be significant suspicion that even if there's no cardiac involved but now, that they would need further screening later on. Um, but of course, interesting that uh, 
that was negative on echo and MRI, but still picked up on PET. Um, and I don't know what how often that happens, but clearly it's not. So to common. my knowledge, this is the first time I have seen that. Yeah. I read I read a lot of these, uh, and I you know I involved with some of the literature uh, reviews and stuff like that. I have I have never encountered one like this uh, uh, before. Um, the other the other issue is the dynamic nature of this. So now because we have treatment, we uh, your presentation and most of the literature is focused on diagnosis and getting them to therapy. And none of the, the technologies we have, to my knowledge, have uh, been able to so far be good enough to detect improvement based specifically on, let's say, uh, does the apical sparing go away if we start treating these patients? Yeah. Uh, does the uh, diastolic function improve? Uh, does the pattern on MRI of uh, uh, failure of nulling of the myocardium get better? Uh, Extracellular space, do we, how do we measure that as with time? I'm not aware of of longitudinal studies on that, and nuclear the same way. The only place where there is this kind of dynamic imaging is uh, PET uh, with the uh, Pittsburgh agent. It's a carbon-based agent, and right. that's for AL only. And that's shown that actually after you treat these patients, you actually can normalize the PET. So that's uh, the space that I'm aware there is. But So there is a lot of uh, research and work to be done uh, in post-treatment and the role of imaging in post-treatment because we don't want to wait for the outcomes for heart failure, for death, or, That's right. or, uh, for uh, development of, let's say, conduction abnormalities. We want to figure out if they're responders and we can detect that as we can use imaging as a marker for improvement uh, early. And so in the, in the future, we have multiple uh, types of therapies. Hopefully, we, we figure out right away that one of them failed just from imaging and then switch them to other therapies. Uh, that's, so right. that's, that's where the research is right now and should be right now. Exactly. And as we pick up more of these patients that we weren't picking up five to 10 years ago, then we definitely will have the sample size, if you will, to conduct the studies to look at um, surveillance, um, whether they've had medical therapy or not, to see how whether um, if, you know helps to monitor the disease process that's altered by treatment or not. So I think that will be very useful um, research to conduct in the near future. And also in the area of MRI, there is um, newer techniques that are coming out in terms of for example, uh, fingerprinting and other methods that potentially can help us better quantify these differences in the underlying myocardial processes and infiltration. Um, and that, that will also potentially be helpful in uh, assessing the diagnostic, prognostic, and also the monitoring of therapy in these uh, patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. Tom, thank you so much. Zoom Thanks. is telling yeah. me we have one more minute. Uh, thank you and have a nice uh, weekend. I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Dr. Jaber.